All right, welcome to another episode of That's Your Garbage, the board game reviews. Um, today we're going to be going over the Game of Thrones board game. Uh, it's me, Mike, and I have G here with me. Hey. And uh, we're pretty much going to do the same as always. We're going to get the components of the game. We're going to talk about how to set up the game. We're going to do the gameplay, the combat, and then we're going to give an overall score at the end. Okay, so before we did this review, uh, we wanted to experience the game a lot uh, because it is a really big game. It takes a long time to play. Um, there are a few variabilities that can affect the game, but we'll get into that soon. But we wanted to make sure that we had played the game with a few different people because every time you play the game with someone new, they always have a different play style. Uh, play the game with varying amounts of people, so four, five, and six players. Um, and pretty much at its core, it's a basic war game where, uh, where yourself and a few others are battling for control of seven castles or strongholds. Um, there's a pretty good amount of strategy, uh, but the best part is screwing over your opponents. Which are your uh, friends. Which are your friends. Who may not remain your friends later. <laughs> Alliances are, are pretty much the important factor of the game. And uh, the winner of the game can easily steal the game at the last moment. Uh, which leaves a lot of suspense all the way through. So uh, as you guys can see, the uh, game is set up for a six-player game right now. We have uh, the Starks, which are the grey tokens. Greyjoy, which is black tokens. Lannister, which is red. Uh, Tyrell, which is green. Martell, which is copper. I don't know if you can really see them there, but they're at the bottom. And Baratheon, which is bright yellow. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the individual components that each house has. Uh, we're going to start off with the, I guess they're called combat markers. Uh, the first set is the boats. Then we have footmen. Then we have knights. And then we have siege weapons, which look a lot like knights. And you can kind of get confused. Uh, those represent like what your, your armies look like on the board. Uh, then we have the house order markers, which on one side show the emblem of the house you're playing, and then on the opposite side have the actual order. There's five separate orders, but you know you don't really need to see them all. <laughs> <laughs> We're lazy. <laughs> all right, then we have the house car, uh, screens, and uh, those actually show you how orders work. They show you what your army starts off looking like on the board. They show you where you start off on the various influence tracks you see at the bottom of the board here. And they also have really good art on yeah, them. Yeah, they're actually really nice cool. looking. Yeah. And, um, Each house has a little one that's a little bit different. We'll post pictures. Yeah, they're actually pretty cool. Uh, then we got the house cards, which show uh, the symbol of your house and then the individual pictures of some of the main characters from the books. And, and you, Melisandre is really hot. Yeah, if you're a woman <laughs> and you're in Game of Thrones and you're not Brienne, you look awesome. Yeah, essentially. They take your age down by like 20 years. Yeah. Even Catelyn Stark <laughs> yeah, looks Catelyn unreal. Yeah, Stark looks like she's like 16 yeah. in her youth. It's in her years. youth after popping out four yeah. kids. Uh, turn markers, which you see here. Nope. There. This counts the rounds, so every turn that little thing goes up. Hourglass. Yeah. Hourglass, that's the word I was looking for. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, then we have Tides of Battle cards, which are here. We're going to talk about these a little bit more. Um... One of the people that we usually play this game with does not like Tides of Battle. Yeah, he part, part of the website, his name is Lorenzo. <coughs> Lorenzo, uh, he hates Tides of Battle cards. We'll get into um, that. Westeros cards, which are the, basically you play one of these every turn. Can you see my pointing? Yeah. So yeah, these are the Westeros cards. The Iron Throne, which is here. The Sword, here. And the Crow. Those give special abilities to whoever is in the first point on the various influence tracks. So if you're number one here, you get the Iron Throne. The fiefdom track gives you the sword, and the King's Court gives you the Raven. Yeah, we'll go into more detail uh, what they do have, later. Sorry, yep, we also have the Wildlings track. This moves up when you play Westeros cards that have the little Wildling symbol, which looks like this. It's upside down, but that's it. And these are, when the track gets to the 12, you flip a card, or sometimes it tells you to play cards, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and basically whenever you flip one of these cards, the Wildlings attacking from the wall. That's it for the components, so we'll come back with gameplay. Alright, so the game has a lot of layers to it, but the game mechanic is quite simple. Uh, there's three phases. The game only lasts 10 rounds, or until one person uh, on this victory track here, as soon as they hit the seven, game's over. Yeah, so you basically don't want your opponents to do that before. So if anyone's teetering on six, you, you pretty them. much gotta kill them. Game turns go like this. There's phase one, where you draw Westeros cards and resolve them. So essentially you'll flip over all the Westeros cards and then resolve them in order. Um, so like right now we have a muster, so you recruit new units uh, for like strongholds in it and stuff like that. We'll, get, we'll go towards uh, mustering later. Winter is coming, which you immediately shovel the deck and draw a new card. And then Wildlings attack, 
So pretty much the wildlings will attack and you'll flip over one of the wildling attack cards. Um, so that's phase one. Phase two is where you place your order tokens and G is going to demonstrate how that works. So G's tokens, he's playing as Baratheon right now. Okay, so G places order markers down. So G, explain to us what you did and, uh, and how that works. Okay, so basically I went into the big pool of orders which you get where you have th two tokens uh, for each type of order and then plus like a special token for each type of order. I went to the, the tokens I had. I picked three for each army I have on the board. Every army or individual like figure has to have an order token before the next phase of the game can continue. So I placed one here for these guys, one here for the boats because they're an army together, and then one here for this lone ranger by himself. All right. Okay, so the next phase is going to be resolving the turn order, uh, the turn tokens. So essentially, based on where you are on the influence track here, you'll see the Brathians first, then it goes Lannister, Stark, uh, Martell, Greyjoy, and Tyrell. So essentially, in order, everyone will reveal their turn order. Actually, everyone reveals everyone the turn order at, at, at the same time. Just like you put them all down simultaneously. But then Baratheon will be the first one who gets to act on one of their order markers. Then it goes in turn order after there. Um, so, G, flip over your order markers. Okay, so I'll start with Dragonstone. And then something else, Shipwrecker Bay. And I have no idea what this is, the Kingswood. Okay, so... All right, so essentially, what were you planning here? So, so basically, this wouldn't all happen at once, but I would use this move token with these guys to move my knight, you stay there, uh, through the boats to this area. And you can do that as long as boats are connected. So if I had this, sorry, now I'm flipping around here, I would be able to like go here or here, right? So, so essentially, if the boats are in any water area... As long as there's an adjacent boat. As long as there's an adjacent boat and they're in a water area that's touching land, land they can move to that spot. Yeah, so basically, I'm going to move from these from here to here. So now I have, I've I've moved my knight from Dragonstone to the king. Yeah. Now this token gets removed. And then my next turn would be to like move these guys into Storm's End to take the castle. There we go. And he would, he would be waiting to see what well, yeah. on the board, and then he would have to react that way. But so everyone can kind of see what you're it. planning on doing or what they think you're planning on doing. And then you can talk about that pretty much at any point of the game. Yeah, and make deals. And, and make deals. And break deals and then not be friends with Lorenzo anymore. <laughs> and that's and that, <laughs> in essence, the is the game. Yeah. Breaking deals, making deals. Um, so we'll get into the combat now. Uh, we'll set up a quick combat on the board. So how it works is um, combat is actually pretty much just a numbers game. Um, these guys here, the footmen, are worth one point. The knights are worth two points. And that's pretty much it. So right now, they're at an even four and four. So let's say G had a move token here, and he was kind of going to here to do the bone way. Then next after that would be you would decide... Um, if you have any bonuses. And so the bonuses can be house cards. Uh, the Valerian Steel, if you are the one on top. Yeah, the Valerian Steel is pretty much <laughs> the sword here. So whoever owns the fiefdom track gets the steel. And uh, essentially, they would get a plus one if they decide to use it for that battle. You can only use it for one battle. Once per turn, yeah. Once per turn. Um, so then you play house cards, and you'll see if anyone's supporting you. So... Let's say the Tyrells were here and they decided to support. Um, I'll say I'll play the Mart I'll play Martell and they're supporting uh, the Martells in this fight, which will never happen. But let's just say it did. Yeah. Um, That's definitely not something that would happen in the books. No. So <laughs> let's say they did that. Their number would add to the total number of the Martell. So right now the the, the Baratheon's losing quite significantly. Uh, it's actually screwed. six to three. So he's pretty screwed. Yeah. Okay, so now you would just play your house card. Um, because I think I'm winning this fight, I'm going to play Obara Sand, which pretty much just gives a plus two uh, to the overall power. So now I'm sitting at eight. And then we'll see what so G he, decided to do. He's definitely going to win. So I'm going to play Patch Face because I don't like this douchebaggery. And what this <laughs> basically allows me to do is, I don't know if you guys can read it, I get to look at his hand and remove one of his cards. So in this case, I would remove his, what's his name? The Red Viper? The yeah. Red Viper. I'd remove the Red Viper so he wouldn't be able to use it later. Yeah. So the next time I attack, this shit doesn't happen. So that's where the strategy comes in a little bit. The Red Viper is actually the strongest card for Martell. 
which gives an actual plus four, which would have been stupid for me to play now because I'm already significantly winning. Yeah, but you lost them anyway. Which but I lost them anyway, so good for you. When you play the Game of Thrones, you win or you die. <laughs> Aww, <laughs> that is so cliche. It is. Um, <laughs> that's pretty much battling. That's combat, uh, yeah. yeah the, the there, is, there is Tides of Battle, which we'll just talk about really quickly. Yeah. There are these cards here. And how this basically works is he would have drawn one. Uh, no, wait, I think... Yeah, attacker goes attacker first. Goes so first. I would have drawn the card. So I would have flipped up. That gives me a plus zero. Can they see that? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's fine. Plus zero. Okay. And then he would have flipped, and he would have got a plus one. Yeah. Which would have just made that combat even more egregious. Yeah. But, I mean, these vary from plus zero to plus three. If you're Lorenzo, your opponent will always get plus three, and you'll never win combat. <laughs> even though there's only one in the yeah. deck. There's two in the deck. There's two in the deck. And which is basically why we don't use them very much, because they really do tend to screw up. Like carefully laid plans, which I guess is the point. Yeah, it's like, like it or not. Yeah. Okay, so so one thing we should cover is now that Brathian has lost, they would have to jump back to where they attacked from. So they attacked from Storm's End. The other thing we didn't cover was uh, Obara San had this the sword icon on the bottom, and Patchface didn't have anything. If so, I would have lost one. Yeah. If I would have won that combat, the sword would have killed one of his units. Um, probably the knight and then the other one would have got pushed back and I would have killed the knight um, in return if he would have had a sword one of my guys would have died because I lost the combat so pretty much like that so combat's very basic which is good because a lot of combat happens every round and you don't want to be wasting a lot of time doing it uh, because you need the game to progress yeah you can blow through combat fairly quickly yeah so now we're going to go over some of the other parts of the game that add to the overall experience First, we're going to start with the influence tracks, which grant people various bonuses. Uh, the first two tracks grant bonuses to the person folding, uh, holding the first spot, so Brathian and Greyjoy, respectively. And then the King's Court track, which is the Raven, grants bonuses to the people in the first four spots. The bonuses decrease the further down the track you are, but still, in the top four, you're pretty good to go. I feel like Vanna White. I'm yeah. like, these four <laughs> spots right Yeah, it's here. wicked. Dude, you should totally wear a dress. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> the first track is the, <laughs> the Iron Throne. Which grants uh, the person with the highest rank the ability to choose ties. So who wins or loses based on ties. And this track also determines turn order from first to last. So Baratheon first, Tyrell last, and then everybody else in the order in which they appear. Then we have the Fiefdom track. Uh, that is the highest ranked person gets the Valyrian Steel Sword, which we showed you before. It gives them a plus one combat bonus once per turn. It's an important track to be high on because combat ties are determined by where you sit on this track. So the Iron Throne doesn't actually get to determine... Combat ties. All other ties, yes. Combat ties, no. Uh, if you are in a tie in combat, the house that is higher wins. So if Greyjoy and Tyrell were in a tie, Greyjoy would take it. And then Tyrell would take it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Messenger Raven. Literally. Yeah. The Messenger Raven. Uh, the highest ranked player is allowed to swap out an order token before they are resolved. So if you don't like something you did based on what somebody else does, you can change it. Uh, or you can see the top card in the Wilding Attack deck. And if you don't like it, or you do like it, you could lie, manipulate other players to bid more power tokens, um, which is a pretty good thing to have because power tokens are important. So screwing people out of power tokens is a legitimate strategy to win the game. Uh, to get power tokens, you need to use consolidate power markers, which are these little things here. They're all crowns. You get more if you put them on spaces that have crowns, and that they basically just give you power tokens. Uh, if you're on the Raven track, the higher you are, you get these. You see these stars here. They give you orders with stars on them, which are better than regular orders. So if you're going to be launching a massive attack, you kind of want to be higher up on the track than the person you're attacking because it makes sure that they can't play so many special orders. Yeah, the one, the one G just showed was a support plus one. So yeah. anybody you're supporting, either your own faction or somebody else's faction, they get a plus one to whatever you actually brought into that So combat. yeah, if you bring in an army worth three points and you have this, it's actually worth four points. Yeah. So power tokens with uh, star tokens are way better than regular order tokens. Um, then we're just going to talk about now supply, which is the supply track which you see in front of you. And basically you cannot exceed your supply. If you currently have four supply, but had six last time it was reconciled, you can continue to use six supply though until you reconcile it again. So you can, you can exceed it as long as you don't have to reconcile, so you're kind of gambling. But then once you have to reconcile, you need to get rid of units that are over your army limit yeah. without going over. So in this case, Stark would only be able to have an army of three and two, whereas everybody else is able to have three armies of three and two and two. Yeah. And an army is when you have two units in the same spot. So these two boats together would count as an army. Uh, these two together would count as an army. 
So Baratheon is actually okay because this is like just the start of the game. So Baratheon right now has 3-2-2. So he could still have an army of three on Dragonstone and then two others here. And he'd be fine. He'd yeah. be within the supply. You can have as many territories with one figure on it as you want. That does not have anything to do with the supply. It's only when you have armies, which is a group of two or more. Yeah. So then these two actions are mostly accomplished through the rest, rest of Rose cards that are played at the beginning of each new round. However, most of the time it's usually the king who decides whether all players muster, reconcile supply, or do nothing. This adds an inherent benefit to being the king as you can control the flow of the game. Also, if you are currently in a good position, not allowing others to muster units can make for a great way to hold your lead. Basically screws them from being able to attack you. Which yeah, is what which you will do. make them have to gang up, gang up on yeah. you. And so if you hold like a pretty good alliance with people, then... Yeah, and then the thing is too, if people don't like each other and you force them to team up against you, they might not be likely to do that, especially if they just spent the last three turns attacking each other. Attacking each other, yeah, exactly. Likewise, because the supply track is only reconciled in cards and the king allows it to happen, you can take advantage of having an inflated army. Yeah, so the king can pretty much have, an inf like say Baratheon was the king, he was sitting at four, um, and then a, a time came up where it said reconcile supply, or two other things, he could decide, you know what, if I reconcile supply, I'm going to lose units. Because I don't follow here. He's like, forget it. I'm not going to do that. We'll do something else. So that gives him an inherent benefit to being the, the king. It's yeah. good to be the king. It is. It's wicked to be the king. And then, so we're just going to talk about wildling attacks, which as you see here, when we flip those turn cards, you get you got the wildling attack card. This is basically the worst card in the game. I hate it so much. It always comes up at the worst time. Yeah. So um, Mike's going to pick one and uh, demonstrate what the effects are. So... Uh, pretty much everyone will have to throw in bids. So depending on how much power you, you've you collected, still have. you still have or collected that you didn't use trying to buy your spot on the influence track. Uh, this one here is essentially the lowest bidder replaces all of his knights with available footmen. So you essentially lose all your knights and you have to put footmen instead. Any knight unable to be replaced is destroyed. So you'll yeah. lose everything. So if you're the lowest bidder in this uh, respect, you will lose everything. Yeah, you, you want Everybody to, else you don't want to be the replaces two other knights with available footmen. Any knight unable to be replaced is destroyed as well. So you have to still do two. So being the lowest bidder, you lose all of them. Being the everyone else, you kind of only have to do two. Uh, and that's only if you lose. So essentially, you'll see on the top of the board here, uh, the wilding track goes up. And that determines um, what... Everyone collectively has to try and beat. So if it's at six, everyone's got to bid over six. Not everybody separately, but everybody as a collective whole playing the game. All, all the houses in Westeros basically got to like sack up and put in power tokens together. Exactly. To the um, and then on this card here, um, if you were the highest bidder and you won, there's no uh, negative for anybody. But the highest bidder may immediately replace two of his footmen with available knights. Which is pretty huge. Which is pretty awesome because that's an extra one plus one in all those areas. Yeah. And that's pretty much the flow of the game. All right, we're going to go over our, our thoughts of the game now. Um, first and foremost, the game needs to be played with like five to six people. Uh, we've both played games with three or four, and it's, we didn't enjoy it. It's, it's not the just, same. There's, there's, I mean, you could basically win the game without actually fighting anyone if you're playing with three or four. Especially with three, because you're really only playing with Baratheon, Stark, and Lannister. And I mean... You know, Baratheon just goes north, Stark goes south, and Lannister goes, like, south, there's no combat, which is kind of pointless. Yeah. I mean, you'll spend most of your time fighting empty spaces, which is, I mean, that's not really, that's not the Game of Thrones. Yeah, that's not really fun. It should be really about dickery. each other. Yeah, yeah it's, about, it's about dickery. Who can screw over the most people and win it is what that game, this game's about. We highly recommend the game for six. with six, yeah. which makes it pretty tough to play because it's hard to get six people together for four hours, for four hours to play the game because the game does take a long time to play. Yeah. It's um, like Risk. It's like sitting down to play Risk. Yeah. You're uh, be there a while. Yeah. But you spend a lot of time just talking and making alliances and stuff like that. Um, and drinking that, that important beer. So the game could... Yeah, you got to drink beer. And the game gets a little bit longer. Um, we really find that the Starks start the game with a disadvantage. Uh, it looks like on the map they have the most space, but there's really not many there's resources not a lot there. Going on like here, you got you know crowns which just give you power tokens. Here they got one more supply, one more supply here. But then like you got to send a guy to this spot before you can drop a power token to claim it. And I mean you got to remember you got the Greyjoys right here. And if they if they start coming north, you basically have to take Moat Caitlin and hold Moat Caitlin like you would in the books. 
So I guess it's true to that, but like you really need to hold more cable. Yeah, you really. If while you're trying Stark, to send like random guys up north to do stuff. Yeah, if you're Stark, you really want to hold Mo Caitlin as soon as possible. Like if you can get there and hold that position, you're in a good spot. But you're spending a lot of time on the defense. Yeah, you're um, not really. You're not really going south to claim anything in the early game. Another thing we noticed that is if the Lannister and the Greyjoy decide to make an alliance, it really yeah it gets, toughens the game for everybody. It gets crazy. If the Lannisters and Greyjoy start to attack each other, they basically take each other right out of the game, though. Yeah. So there's that, too, because they start off easily in the best positions, yeah. and they both can build really big armies really quickly, and they just if they go at each other, they're not going to be going at anybody else, and if they team up, they're going to basically steamroll the rest of the world. Yeah. So, so in that like, it's sense... It's good that they hate the each game, other in the books. Yeah, in that sense, the game really... Um, varies on who you're playing with which is why we wanted to play a few games with a bunch of different people just to see how other people interact with the game um and what combos people came up with yeah we noticed that a few of our friends have more like passive uh, like they're more passive people and they don't like doing the combo than we have other people who just go all out yeah i'm pretty sure mark played his starts one game and literally spent the entire like 10 game rounds just going around the north like this yeah so it really depends which is cool if that's what you want to do i mean no, no problems but it really depends on who you play with. Yeah. So if you're not an evil person, this game's not for you. <laughs> <laughs> the game won't be as fun, but it's still an enjoyable experience for pretty much everyone playing. Um, the Greyjoys, I think, have the strongest cards in the game. Yeah. Uh, based on their strengths and abilities. The Starks um, have a good combo, but it's not as dumb as the Greyjoy one. The Starks have a fantastic combo. I really like the combo. The uh, the Roose Bolton Rob Stark Ned Stark combo. Yeah. Roose Bolton. When you lose a battle, you get all the cards back from your discard pile, which is phenomenal. Um, so you just play him and lose on purpose. And yeah, play him, like also. lose a, a petty battle and get all your cards back. It's it's amazing. If you have like someone that you're allying with, like fight against them and just lose so you guys both know you're losing, it's great. Yeah. Uh, Tyrells, I think, have the weakest cards. Yeah, they do have the card with the chick with the beer-flavored nipples, though. Yeah, so, I mean, so that's a bonus. Everybody wants Marjorie Tyrell. <laughs> People have like died over Marjorie Tyrell. Spoiler. <laughs> yeah. Spoiler alert. Um, Baratheon really has a big open area. Um, which kind of kind of sucks, but that's just kind of the way the yeah. The board they also goes. do have a pretty strong starting position. Yeah, Baratheon. If, if Dorn doesn't come at you like a spider monkey, you're pretty much unopposed. Yeah. You get King's Landing. You get the Eyrie. And there's a lot of castles and strongholds sitting in this area. Yeah. That you could pretty much get almost at the beginning of the game uncontested. Yeah. If you if you get a couple of good muster and supply cards all at once, you just be you're in a good position. Yeah, and that branches into the randomness that actually G. Want to talk about? So, do you give us the randomness? Like we said, we've played a lot of the games, and uh, I've actually played a game where we played four rounds and no muster cards have come up. So, we basically spent four rounds with the amount of figures you see on the board right now, and, and people were losing figures because they were losing battles, and nobody was getting any re like any more troops, and it was it was just a rigmarole. The game ended up dragging out a lot longer than it should have because you know we couldn't fight anybody, we couldn't take any castles, we couldn't build more guys. We were just dancing around the board trying not to get completely wiped out. And uh, the other thing we, we don't like about the randomness is if you play with the Tides of Battle, they are an option. You don't have to. You could effectively like show up with like three, uh, three points more combat than somebody you're fighting, and he flips a Tide of Battle card and gets that plus three, and you get a plus zero, and he ends up tying you or winning. Yeah. And it, it just really gets on your nerves. I mean, I guess it's realistic in a sense that you don't really know what's going to happen when you start fighting a war, but... I mean, when you're Lorenzo and it happens to you three times per game and there's only really like two plus threes in that whole deck and it just gets, it can get really ridiculous. So that, that, that kind of makes the game a little bit, I don't, I like it a little bit less, but again, it's an option. You don't have to use it. So there is that. So it's not that big of a deal. So now that we just spent the last few minutes just bashing the game, we really want to <laughs> say that we really like the game. Yeah. That was all uh, the negative stuff. Yeah. We have to get it out awesome there. Stuff. You can't do a review without the negatives, Yeah, but to close it off, we really like the game. We really think Fantasy Flight Games nailed a, it. Yeah, they did a great job uh, making the components a. Components are beautiful too. Yeah, the components are fantastic. The art looks great. Uh, they did a great job bringing George R. R. Martin's story to life. A lot of strategy, a lot of political intrigue peppered all over it. Yeah. If you're um, friends with people when you sit down to play this game, there's a chance that when you walk away, you will not be friends with them anymore. Yeah, totally. Agree. I hate playing this game with my girlfriend because she's a snake. <laughs> and she's never once not screwed me at this game. Um, and then, like, I got to pretend that we're okay about it after, and it really <laughs> pisses me off. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> we're both really excited for some expansions that come out. We know expansions are going to come out. FFG's bread and butter is expansions. 
Um, they release expansions all the time, which was we we love it. We, we're sick. happy about that. Just give me more stuff. We, what we want to see. Take my money. What we want to see is we want to see leaders on the board. I would That'd love cool. to have like, like say like Rob Stark. Stark. Figure, yeah. yeah. Um, I would love to see the the mountain on the board. Adding like combat bonuses for that area, and then having them be killed would be phenomenal. I don't know how they would set that up. I think it would be a nice addition to the game. We want to have the addition of I don't know why the Targaryens. I don't know why they're not in here. Um, I mean, I understand that they're not really involved in the game, but come on. I know. Games. I know. It <laughs> would be cards should just be dragons. It would be. Port. It would be really awesome <laughs> to have the Targaryens in the game. Uh, I guess they could branch onto this side of the board. I don't know how they would do it. Um, but we can dream. We could dream. I think it'd be amazing. I would absolutely love it. I'd pay money. Yeah, I would definitely pay money to have the Targaryens in the game. And that's pretty much it. That's that's our review. Uh, guys, before we close off, check out our like us on Facebook. Check out our other YouTube videos. We've done other board game yeah, reviews. Other games. Uh, follow us on Twitter. Check out our website. That's your garbage.com. We're giving this game an 8.5 out of 10. And uh, that's your garbage. <laughs>